So now, um, joining us online from um, Canada is uh, Professor Stephen Prescott. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, I hope it's not so early for you now on, the, um, on that side of the world. But uh, I can give you the floor now. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for, for the invitation. And uh, no, it's, it's uh, 11 o'clock here. So thank you for scheduling me in the evening your time. Uh, this worked out well. I just want to confirm that you can see my slides as well as my cursor. Can someone please confirm that? Yes, we can. Wonderful. OK, so I have a couple of disclosures to get out of the way, first of all. Uh, and, and with that done, I, I want to actually start with a few um, illusions. Um, th this is actually very similar to what Fernando Severo showed you a couple of days ago. Uh, but, but I want to start with some illusions to try to convince you that what you perceive depends not only on the sensory input, it also depends a lot on how your brain processes that input. So I think most people will agree that if you look at the, the two squares marked with a, with a star, that the one on the left looks bluish and the one on the right looks um, yellowish. But if I cover up the surrounding color, you can actually see that they are in fact exactly the same shade of gray. Now, if I put back that color, I don't know about you, but, but I can't make my visual system see gray, despite the fact that that's what the actual stimulus is. So that's an example where the spatial context is in fact very important for how you perceive color. Now I wanna give you another visual illusion where the timing is actually very important. So what I want you to do, hopefully this will work online and, and um, with, with the projection. I want you to look at her nose and just simply to, to stare for a while. Try not to break your gaze, just keep looking and looking, looking. Hopefully for a brief moment, you saw her pop out in color. And if you go back to the original image here, there really is no color. There is no, no flesh color um, there, but, but based on the rates of adaptation of, of photoreceptors and whatnot, can create this color through, through an after image effect. Now we're doing these visual illusions because it's actually very difficult to do some out of sensory illusions um, as a group, let alone doing them uh, virtually. But there are such things as some out of sensory illusions, for instance, um, the thermal grill illusion. The idea here is that you have warm and cool bars interlaced. If you touch the warm bar, it feels warm. Touch the cool bar, it feels cool. But when they're interlaced and you lay your hand down as shown in this image, you have this weird burning sensation. And you might have had a similar sensation uh, in the absence of any sort of noxious hot temperature, um, if your hands are, are numb from the cold, for instance, in the middle of winter, and you go inside and you wash them in warm water, it feels oddly hot or, or burning, or maybe ice cold. It's sort of a weird sensation, but but it's not what you would have expected. Um, and and that, those are examples of sort of um, you know a distorted stimulus or an abnormal stimulus causing this. But you can actually experimentally sort of induce this sort of uh, effect also by using a blood pressure cuff, for instance, to to selectively block input from um, myelinated like A beta fibers um, and, and just letting the, the C fibers sense the temperature and you'll get the same sort of, of effect. So, so that's just, you know, as I say, to start off with trying to convince you that, that the processing is in fact very important for how you perceive stimuli. It's not just about the stimulus. Now, now this is um, a, a lot of modern pain science is, is in fact motivated by the gate control theory. And we've heard about it multiple times uh, this morning um, that there was a presentation that, that covered this. But just very, very briefly, the whole idea behind the, the, the gate control theory published by Malzak and Wall um, back in 1965 is that you have these high threshold or nociceptors, high threshold fibers, and they will activate fibers which normally would evoke a painful sensation. But those same neurons um, can receive input from low threshold or A beta fibers. Um, and, and the predominant effect of activating the, the low threshold fibers is that they tend to activate inhibitory neurons, which can in fact reduce or gate the pain signal. Um, so, so we now understand a lot about, you know, much more about the circuitry that happens in, in the, the, that exists in the spinal dorsal horn. But even as, as early as 1965, um, this, this theory was being utilized to develop um, new neuromodulation techniques. Uh, so it was in fact the first case report by Sheely et al in 1967 that they tried out this idea of dorsal column or spinal cord stimulation. The idea, and, and it's like the peripheral nerve stimulation, which there was also a, a section on uh, this morning, but the idea is that these low threshold fibers, but not the high threshold ones, the low threshold ones have a collateral axon branch that ascends in the dorsal columns. What's nice about that is that if you were to selectively stimulate 
in the dorsal columns, you can try to activate those fibers without any risk of activating the higher threshold nociceptors. Now, the idea here is that if you activate those fibers, you can engage gate control mechanisms with the antidromic spikes that return back into the spinal cord, dorsal horn, into the gray matter, activating these inhibitory neurons and then gating the pain signal. Now, at the same time, you would expect that if you're activating these, these dorsal column axons, that yes, there's an antidromic spike, but their spike will also propagate orthodromically, um, going up to the dorsal column nuclei, grass alicuni, depending on where you're stimulating, um, and will tend to cause paresthesia or a buzzing sensation, or like a, a sense of, of vibration almost. Um, and, and in fact, uh, with conventional low frequency stimulation, 40 to 60 hertz, this has been around for, for, all, for over 50 years, um, the whole idea is, is to activate these dorsal column fibers and you know you've activated them because you get this paresthesia. And clinically, the idea is to try to map the paresthesia over the painful area because if you're activating the right fibers and causing those paresthesias in the same areas of the pain, then you're going to be activating the correct inhibitory neurons and, and engaging the, the, the gate control mechanism. Um, but, but sometimes this paresthesia can actually be um, just un unpleasant and, and can sort of limit the, the dose or, or the intensity of the spinal cord stimulation and, and limit um, the, the analgesia that you can get from it. But it's interesting, therefore, that in the last 10 years or so, um, there has been the development of paresthesia-free um, spinal cord stimulation. The idea is to stimulate at much higher rates. And what I'll say, I'll just mention briefly that, that in looking into this, um, the, I'm not actually familiar with, with high frequency stimulation, um, SCS being used for phantom limb pain, but it is commonly used for back pain and, and some other indications. Um, but, but there is efficacy, at least for the low frequency as, as uh, having some effect, um, some, some positive pain relieving effect uh, in phantom limb pain. But with respect to this high frequency paresthesia free spinal cord stimulation, if you don't have the paresthesia, then presumably you don't have the orthodromic spikes. If you don't have the orthodromic spikes, that suggests you don't have the antidromic spikes and that you're not having an effect by the, the activation of these inhibitory spinal neurons. So if that's the case, then, then what is the mechanism of action? It, it's been quite, been quite um, speculative um, with lots of contradictory information being, being thrown around. So that's where we stepped in to try to figure out um, what was happening. And, and for this, we're actually doing spinal cord stimulation in rats, uh, as you can see here, here with the, the, the spinal cord uh, custom made stimulator inserted in, in the intrathecal space um, over about L1 uh, and, and that sort of schematized over here. Uh, and the idea is to give a bipolar stimulus. So we're using two contacts to deliver constant current stimulation, which has this biphasic symmetrical waveform, very similar to the sort of waveforms that are used uh, clinically, at least for the high frequency. And we wanted to use the same waveform for all frequencies um, from 50 Hertz, which we're gonna compare with one kilohertz um, as well as for a two Hertz uh, search stimulus. Um, and, and all of this is typically applied at about 50% motor threshold, which um, is um, going to cause paresthesia, at least for the, the low frequency, uh, but should not be associated with paresthesia for the high frequency. So that's considered to be sort of clinically uh, appropriate in terms of the, the spinal cord stimulation intensity. And the idea, as you can see, is, is that we should be activating uh, selectively those fibers that are ascending in the dorsal columns, uh, leaving uh, alone those fibers that are, are further um, caudal uh, in, in the, the area of interest. And we're going to be recording from um, neurons from their cell body specifically in the dorsal root ganglion, which is even further spatially removed from the stimulation. Uh, that tells us that we're definitely recording from, from the primary afferents. So people have already shown um, with, with behavioral testing in, in rats, um, that the sort of spinal cord stimulation, both 50 hertz as well as one kilohertz spinal cord stimulation can relieve neuropathic pain in rats. Uh, we didn't want to re re you know, redo those sorts of experiments. Uh, and instead, we wanted to just do some basic comparisons of other sort of clinic clinically meaningful uh, measurements. For instance, people know that, that 50 hertz um, stimulation in, in patients will reduce the Hoffman spinal reflex as the, the monosynaptic um, stretch reflex. Uh, and, and in our hands, both 50 hertz and one kilohertz will you know, almost completely abolish um, that reflex. So, so the two forms of stimulation seem to be acting quite similarly uh, and, and consistent with uh, clinical measurements uh, in, in people. 
Uh, likewise, if we look at the somatosensory evoked potential, so this is now applying an electrical stimulus to a peripheral nerve and recording from S1, looking at the field potential, what we can see is that 50 hertz and one kilohertz attenuate are reduced by about 50% the amplitude of the somatosensory evoked potential. So again, both forms of, of, of stimulation seem to be having a, a very similar effect. Now, in the process of, of recording the somatosensory evoked potentials, we were just recording continuously. So this, this came for free, but it, it's sort of interesting. So you see here that this is now a spectrograms uh, from a typical rat, and the ticks show the timing of the peripheral nerve stimuli, which you can see cause you know, an increase in power across a broad range of frequencies. But what I'll draw your attention to is that during the 50 hertz spinal cord stimulation, not only is there an attenuation of those sort of um, responses to, to the peripheral nerve stimulation, you also see that there's quite a significant increase in power sustained during the spinal cord stimulation across a broad range of frequencies. Uh, and interestingly enough, that is completely absent during the one kilohertz spinal cord stimulation, suggesting perhaps that, that you know, maybe this is a signature, an electrophysiological signature of the paresthesia that would be associated with this sort of stimulation and which we know is absent with this other higher frequency stimulation. But now to get to the, the, the sort of thrust of this, this presentation, well, what's, what's going on? So, so if we record here, what I'm showing you are rasters. So each row is the spike times, each tick is a spike from multiple different uh, neurons recorded, um, some from, you know, simultaneously from the same rat, others from, from multiple different rats, but, but each row is a different neuron. And what you can see here is that during 50 hertz um, stimulation, you get you know, a lot of neurons responding you know, quite regularly. You know, sometimes you see bursts, but many of them fire continuously um, during this 50 hertz uh, stimulation. So, so blue ticks, blue, blue data shown in blue are always from the 50 hertz stimulation. Now I'm gonna show you uh, the same sort of results uh, in response to one kilohertz stimulation. We actually see that contrary to a lot of what has been published, uh, we see activation of, of these um, dorsal column axons by the one kilohertz stimulation. Now there's some differences in pattern here. Um, it, it looks more bursty. Um, you know, maybe you can see that there, there's some other differences and I'll get to that in a second. But, but interestingly enough, we were activating these neurons. Now we can sort of break this down in many different ways. I just want to draw your attention here that at 50 hertz stimulation, a lot of neurons will fire at 50 spikes per second or at 50 hertz. Some of them will fire slower and that sort of corresponds to where there's these bursts. But at one kilohertz stimulation, you have this whole sort of range of, of different firing rates um, uh, during, during the this, this stimulation. Some of the neurons are, you know, actually firing, you know, quite, quite fast up to, to about 200 hertz, um, you know, and, and other ones are, are firing a, a lot slower. I'll just mention here, I'm only showing you the first 20 seconds of stimulation, but we actually did a lot of recordings out to two hours to make sure that this wasn't a very transient effect. Uh, and in fact, um, you, you see the same sort of pattern of responses, uh, two hours uh, into the spinal cord stimulation. We can't go much longer than that um, in these, uh, these terminal rat experiments, however. But we were sort of surprised by this and we're really concerned about, you know, making sure we'd really seen um, the, the, the activation of these dorsal column um, axons because, you know, as I mentioned uh, briefly, you know, a lot of people have, have published that one kilohertz um, or, or higher kilohertz frequency stimulation does not activate um, those axons. So we wanted to use um, some, some independent methods, especially because we're actually dealing with very large electrical artifacts, which could, for instance, you know, mess with the, the, the detection, the sorting of spikes and whatnot. Um, so phospho-ERC phospho um, is this, it's sort of like CFOS, if you're familiar with that. The idea is that um, this, this kinase gets phosphorylated when neurons are active. Um, and so under sham conditions, you can see that there's very little red signal. Um, you know, uh, with both 50 hertz and one kilohertz and different, different animals, different rats, uh, we can see that there's really strong phosphorylation of this, this kinase, um, you, know, can, you know, providing evidence that indeed these neurons, you know, we weren't just looking at an artifact, these neurons were in, indeed active uh, and that's reflected by the immunohistochemistry, this, this marker uh, phospho-ERC. Now we also wanted to, to this, this has like basically no temporal resolution. So we wanted to sort of look at this in other ways as well. So um, we, we turn to uh, decamp based calcium imaging. So I'm just going to show you a movie very quickly here. I'm going to fast forward to just before we turn on the SCS. So you see this neuron, you can see the nucleus in the middle. It's a very faint green color. Uh, when we start turning on the SCS, you'll start to see it get much, much brighter. 
that's telling you that there's a whole bunch of calcium that comes in. And, and now you start to see it flicker, um, which sort of you know, probably corresponds to these bursts and whatnot. And we know that, that most of this calcium is coming in through voltage gated um, calcium channels that are activated exclusively um, during action potential. So we know that this is an indicator of, of spiking. And so we've quantified that down here um, where you see basically whether it's 50 hertz or one kilohertz, this is now imaging from the same neuron and, and subsequent trials, you see this very large calcium signal at the onset of either type of, of stimulations telling us, um, you know, a, a, as expected, um, we're definitely activating these neurons uh, regardless of any electrical artifacts or other things that might have, have compromised the electrophysiological recordings. So with that, I want to go back to now the electrophysiological data to try to explain to you what, what's the difference between the 50 hertz response and the one kilohertz response. And so what I'm showing you here is taking all of the data, all of the spikes from all of the neurons and projecting it onto this uh, interspike interval plotted against time. And you see actually very few data points because all of the data points from all of the neurons are sitting on top of one another. Uh, and what we can, what I'll draw your attention to is that essentially all of these neurons are firing the vast majority of their action potentials or spikes at a 20 millisecond interval. And that corresponds to the period of stimulation when you're stimulating at 50 Hertz. Now, what that means in terms of the firing rate is what you see up here is that basically every neuron spikes and then it waits 20 milliseconds to the next stimulus pulse and then it will spike again. And then it'll wait, everything's quiescent, spike, wait, spike. So this lockstep, everything's spiking synchronously. And that's very different from when you do exactly the same analysis um, during the one kilohertz stimulation. Now what you see is that, you know, this firing rate histogram is much smoother. And that's because you're firing, you're, you're, you're applying the stimulation 20 times faster, not every one millisecond you're applying a stimulus pulse, but that's too fast for the neurons to fire. There's, they, there's actually no spikes occurring at a one millisecond interval. There's a few that occur at a two millisecond interval, but actually the neurons are quite happy to fire at three or four or five milliseconds, which you can see here based on the envelope sort of outlining this, this, um, this histogram over here. So, so basically by applying the, the stimulus so fast that the neuron can't entrain one-to-one, -one, what it starts doing is it starts skipping, but different axons will skip different stimulus cycles. And what happens is as a population, they all become desynchronized. Uh, and that's what's reflected up here with the firing rate histogram. Now, if that didn't make sense, I'm just going to try to, to show this a little bit differently. So I'm taking two simultaneously recorded um, axons. And if you zoom in on one area where they're both firing at around the same time, you can see during 50 hertz stimulation, the, the spikes are in fact superimposed. They're sitting on top of one another. They're so it's perfectly synchronized. And that's in contrast with the one kilohertz stimulation, where even when they're, they're, the bursts are occurring, um, at the same time, if you look at the spikes within that burst, you can see that they're occurring in response to different stimulus pulses. So we, we can explain this, we can reproduce this entirely um, with, with a simple um, phenomenological computer model. Basically what we've done here is, is showing you rasters from that computer model where the first row is the same parameters uh, as the first row with 50 Hertz versus one kilohertz. Uh, we can reproduce this this pattern here. Um, and the whole idea is that you need a fast refractoriness to account for the failure to, re, uh, to respond at, at, at very, very short intervals. But then you actually need this after depolarization or what, if you're an electrophysiologist, a supernormal phase of excitability that encourages um, responses at this intermediate interval. Um, and then you also need a slow after hyperpolarization or adaptation that will, will interact with the medium ABP to create this bursting pattern. But with these, with about six parameters, um, which, which can actually fit now to, to the experimental data, we can fully reproduce these different patterns um, and, and a little bit of heterogeneity, especially with respect to the ADP that seems to be, be quite important for explaining the variability that you can get uh, across these different neurons. But what's more important, so, so we can explain sort of why the axons are behaving the way they do, but the more important question is, well, how are those, those patterns of activity being interpreted by downstream neurons? Now, this is um, a little more speculative. These, these are cartoons, but I'd like to think they're quite sort of biologically realistic cartoons. So just imagine that at 50 Hertz simulation, when I was zoomed in, um, what you can see is that, that if you have multiple sort of inputs, multiple 
dorsocolon axons or these low threshold mechanoreceptors converging onto uh, neurons of interest. In this case, we're sort of thinking about what's happening in the dorsal column nucleus, the gracile or the cuneate. You can see if all of those spikes arrive at the same time, they're going to evoke very strong excitation in this postsynaptic neuron. Now, in a feed forward inhibition scenario, the idea is that those same inputs activate inhibitory neurons, then that neuron is going to receive strong inhibition, but with a slight delay. And because the excitation is so strong, you can actually get output spikes being evoked in the, the dorsal column, um, sorry, in those output neurons before the onset of this very strong inhibition, right? So, so if you keep sort of going like this in a feed forward manner, you, you'd expect that these synchronous spikes can actually be conveyed to, um, to, to the cortex through the thalamus up into layer four cortex and, and so on and so forth, um, because they're always one step ahead of the very strong inhibition that they're, um, that they're concomitantly evoking. But that, that inhibition is always a little bit uh, delayed. Now consider that in contrast with a one kilohertz stimulation where now all of these inputs, these dorsal column axons are now firing at different times. You get this disorganized um, pattern of excitation uh, and this inhibition tends to, to add up. The temporal summation is actually very strong. And now under these conditions, you'd expect that you actually have very weak activation of, of the output neurons. So in this context, when I say, well, do you have paresthesia? I would argue that under these conditions, you do have a signal that can at least make it to the brain. Uh, and, and if it's perceived something like vibration, then yes, this, this sort of signal is associated with paresthesia. This signal where there's sort of very little activation and certainly no structure uh, in the output spiking, uh, I would say that you're, you're not likely to have paresthesia. And I bring you back to these spectrograms that I showed at the beginning where, you know, maybe indeed the, this, this change in, in cortical activity is reflective of this sort of signal arriving in cortex where you don't have that sort of signal arriving uh, in the, the high frequency spinal cord stimulation conditions. Now, in this case, we're dealing with the orthodromic spikes that are going up to the dorsal column nuclei, but what about the antidromic spikes, which seem to be important for analgesia? The orthodromic spikes seem to be different, but we still seem to get analgesia in both cases. So, so why is that? So I've just added down here the idea that, well, you know, we have the, the dorsal column axons, these low threshold mechanoreceptors being activated by spinal cord stimulation, exactly the same way as we've shown up here, where you get this, this pulsatile inhibition so I refer to these as gaps, whereas uh, under the 50 hertz stimulation, uh, with one kilohertz stimulation, you don't have those gaps. You have a more sustained inhibition. But now these, these spinal dorsal horn neurons are receiving this nociceptive input, right? And the question is now with this, it's not a feed forward motif here, a feed forward inhibition. It's more like lateral inhibition or cross modal uh, inhibition. Um, but, but now um, there's no sort of coordination between the excitatory and inhibitory signals, but now you can imagine that if you have this inhibition, the, the spinal dorsal horn will only be able to respond intermittently to this nociceptive input, uh, whereas without gaps, um, you actually have much more reduction, much better closing, sustained closure uh, of the pain gate uh, with the one kilohertz. So I'd argue, well, do you have pain? I would say under these conditions, no, the analgesia is actually very, very good. Over here with the 50 hertz stimulation, I argue, well, you, you probably have less nociceptive signal making it through the gate, uh, but there might still be some. So that, that would actually sort of correspond to why, um, you know, this, this seems to be, um, uh, you know, one kilohertz stimulation can actually be much more um, analgesic. Now, I, I'll go through this very quickly because we, we do know a little bit about how the, the more than, than gate control, about how the spinal cord is organized. Uh, and these are just showing you cross correlograms when we simultaneously record from the primary afferents and this uh, postsynaptic dorsal horn neurons. And to make a long story short, what I want to draw your attention to is, is simply the take home message, which is that excitatory spinal neurons are preferentially activated by rapid adapting low threshold mechanoreceptors, whereas inhibitory spinal neurons are preferentially activated by slow adapting low threshold mechanoreceptor inputs. Now, why that's important for this story is that rapid adapting low threshold mechanoreceptors tend to fire synchronously, whereas slow adapting ones tend to fire asynchronously. Now, that means that these neurons here, these inhibitory spinal neurons can be activated by asynchronous inputs, which are exactly the sort of inputs that we expect them to receive with a high frequency stimulation. So in terms of the take home message, what I just told you is that asynchronous antidromic spikes are sufficient to produce analgesia. Whereas I argue that synchronous orthodromic spikes are necessary to produce paresthesia. 
Now, my talk would normally stop there, but, but based on, on discussions on, on Tuesday, I wanted to add one thing because I worried that my, my presentation gave a very sort of simplistic feed forward um, uh, description of sensory processing. Uh, but, but in all honesty, I believe that perception is really more like a Bayesian process or an informed guesswork where you're trying to infer the cause. So according to Bayes' theorem, the probability of some hypothesis, think of that as, as perception, depends on the sensory evidence right here, according to, to Bayes' theorem. So, so if we were to actually try to sort of say, so under normal conditions, say what's the probability that your hand is contorted given some proprioceptive um, sensory signal? Well, that would depend on, on these other conditions here, but, but long story short, the proprioceptive signals are predictive of limb position. So unless your hand really is contorted in some weird position, the proprioceptor should be telling you, yes, it is, or you know, more often than not, they're, they're correctly telling you that no, your, your hand is in uh, a normal position. But under pathological conditions, so with the phantom limb, all, all of this can change. The, these signals are messed up. They're no longer uh, very specific. They're, they're not reliable. So these aberrant proprioceptive signals are no longer very predictive or accurately predictive of limb position. So, so we might say that this, this posterior distribution is low, but but we have to consider, you know, and this, this gets at this idea of plasticity, but slowly the prior, which is shown over here, this is your expectation, your hypothesis, your internal model of the world, that can be updated and that can help lead to, to false uh, percepts. So the perception of a, a contorted limb or a, a limb being crushed because of, of unreliable signals and an internal model, which is trying to tell you that. Now, I, I think this is sort of notable in this context because you know, your, your perception doesn't necessarily only have to depend on the proprioceptive signals. Maybe you can try to, to intervene with, with visual signals or, or try to get those proprioceptive signals back to something more normal and try to adapt or try to retrain this prior. And, and so for this, I want to finish with another um, sort of demonstration. This time it's take out my microphone. Hopefully this will work for the audience. I'm going to give you a, a short audio clip and see if you can understand what it says. Oh, it's not working. Uh oh. Okay, that's a shame. I'm going to put this back in. Um, Hopefully I haven't crashed it, um, but I think something about uh, PowerPoint on Zoom uh, is preventing it from working because it was working right before I got on. Um, but, but the whole idea here was that you, you couldn't understand this message until you heard it ungarbled. Uh, and then once you'd heard it ungarbled, um, you, you went back and you could clearly you know, understand uh, what was being said, which is, which is not unlike, again, what Fernando Severo was showing a couple of days ago where um, you don't necessarily read you know, the, the, the scrambled text, you can actually, you, you sort of know what to expect and you, you um, your, your internal model will dramatically uh, affect how you perceive that. So it's unfortunate that didn't work. Uh, maybe I can try it later on, um, but in the interest of time, I will move on. And now, What, was that your last uh, slide? Uh, I wanted to go to the acknowledgments, and that is the last slide okay. after that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that was very close, but but yeah, the audio is just not going to cooperate. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, the present members of my lab and the past members, especially Boris, who who was uh, primarily responsible um, for for the experiments I showed you, together with notable contribution from Stephanie Decker, Anushin, Medi, uh, and Aaron, as well as our collaborators specific to this project both at Boston Scientific and McGill uh, and funding for this project from Boston Scientific as well as Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And from there, I will stop and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So th th there are a few questions and I guess maybe um, Eva can ask the question while we get set up in the front here for the panel discussion. Um, right. uh, no, okay. All right, so the question is, Considering amputees with chronic frontal limb pain and central sensitization, is it possible? Is it 
plausible that peripherally mediated gate control will be less effective? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and certainly in neuropathic pain in general, um, the inhibitory mechanisms that are responsible for closing the gate are them, themselves compromised. Um, and and that, that can be because of you know, less GABA or lysine being released. Um, a lot of my work has focused on changes in chloride regulation um, and, and these receptors um, re rely on, on chloride to help uh, mediate inhibition and that, that is compromised. What I would say though is that there's often this, despite stories of this becoming paradoxically excitatory and stuff like that, there usually is some residual inhibition, simply less inhibition. And I think that the point is to try to capitalize on what inhibition is there um, and on mechanisms of inhibition that, that might be more resilient to the pathological changes, but it's absolutely true. And I think this explains, for instance, why different patients might respond differently to, to very similar uh, interventions and why interventions that are effective at, at some point might actually become less effective over time as the disease mechanism itself changes. Hopefully that, that answers um, that particular question.